Hello, welcome to the HVMFC YouTube channel. What I would like for you to do is like and subscribe. Have a blessed day. Coming up on The Inspired Word. Whatever you're going through, if you're that person right now under severe hardship, and you're that person right now that's going through severe testing, severe trial, maybe in your life right now, understand the Lord has made a way of escape for you. which is to seek the lost, teach the found, and send the disciples. To continue to reach our community and people all around the world, I invite you to join us by financially partnering with us on our mission. To do so, go to www.harvestvillage.org slash give. Thank you. Hello, family. Welcome to Harvest Village Online. I'm Pastor Charles Miles, and I'm an awesome match for Perry today. So go get your Bibles, your notepads, your pencils and papers as we get ready to get started. As you open up your Bibles, we want to open it up to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Today's topic is the Lord has made a way of escape. I'm going to start with scripture this morning. The reason I want to start with scripture, I just want to lay a quick foundation, give you a thought process as we go through this, and I'm going to go through a quick story and do some more scripture. We'll have some fun with it today, all right? All right now. It says, no temptation is overtaking you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, and he will not allow you to be tempted above your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to bear. I say the scripture a lot when I'm speaking to you guys, when I teach on, because I want us to always understand that God makes a way that we don't have to be stuck by the devil. When I mean stuck, boxed in, you know, where you feel you can't move, your thought process gets sometimes even there where you feel you, you know, you can't get out of the situation you're in, the hardship, the struggle, the trials in which you're going through. Uh, but sometimes I get a little, uh, I want to say feedback or I get a little pushback because people say, so, well, that talks totally about temptation and temptation is, is, is a very specific thing. But I, that's what I realize a lot of people miss. This scripture is not about the temptation, the things that, you know, that, that we like to do what we should not be doing. It's, it's, it's actually bigger than just temptation it's speaking about. And for us to understand that, we got to go back to the Greek understanding of what the word temptation means. Because the actual Greek text here, with the word is, let me make sure I say it right, it's perosmos. Perosmos. And the reason this word, I want to bring up this word, Greek word perosmos, because if you go back once again to the original text regarding this, that's the word that temptation is used for. And now, to understand the fullness of this right here, because perosmos means test, trial, temptation, or even severe test. So it does not just mean temptation by itself. The word means more than that. So, you know, what it's basically saying to you is no test okay, has overtaken you, but such is common to man. No trial has overtaken you that's not common to man. You know, no severe test has, has overtaken you that's not common to man. Simply meaning whatever hardship, trial, test of tribulation that you're going through on this earth, I want you to understand, okay, God has made a way of escape. Okay, so whatever that hardship is, whatever, whatever that difficult thing that you're going through, God has made a way for you to overcome it. But it's always to overcome it through him and him alone, amen? And I don't want to make that, just make that plain to you guys this morning. Because even in my own life, I have to realize no matter what I'm going through, no matter, you know, what struggle, what, what thing that, that, that seems to have me captivated in this time in life, in life that I may be dealing with, God has made a way of escape, a way for us to get through it, a way for us to overcome it through him, amen? Amen, amen. I want to tell you quickly this story about there being holes and fences, as I'll explain myself. When I was young, I would go to baseball practice, right? And sometimes we would go to baseball practice. We go early enough, the field which we're using is, is wide open. But these fields used to be enclosed in by gates, some of the places that we were going, because sometimes we'd be using schools. If they had baseball fields, and some of these public schools were locked after so long after the school was closed. With that being said, 
we would go to practice, you know, everything is open, but during practice, some, you know, usually the janitor or the security guards, they would come and lock all the gates. And, you know, we looking at the coach like, coach, how are we going to get out? You know, my, you know, most of the coach, don't worry about it, guys. Don't, don't think nothing. We're, we're good. We're good, right? Give you that kind of thumbs up, you know, thought process. And, I'm like, and when I was younger, sometimes we would climb the fence to get out, but that was very rare. Most times the coach says, fellas, don't worry, it's a hole in the fence, Right? And I used to always, I never really thought about it because where I grew up, there was always holes and fences. Like literally somebody would come caught a hole in the fence, you know, where you can get in and out, so to speak, of, of the area or the gates that you, that you needed to go in and out, especially to these fields. And so I, I didn't think too much about it because I was raised in areas like this, right? I was raised in the areas where, you know, people would cut holes in the fences. And once again, so we weren't stuck there. We, we weren't trapped in. And I thought about this a little bit later on in life. You know, sometimes... Satan gets you to a place where you feel all trapped in and you're boxed in. You feel like you, you, know, you can't get away from the situation in which you're dealing with. And I realized, you know, it, it's something because God always leaves a hole in the fence. And God always leaves a way of escape, a way that you can get out. You know, it's, it's Satan's goal or his thought, you know, when he, when he tries to get over to us, basically, through thoughts, ideas, and suggestions is that we're trapped in, we're boxed in, right? And that we can't get away from the trial, the tribulation, the hardship in which we're going through. And a lot of times when our mindsets, you know, starts feeling that way, when we get this on the inside of us that we can't go no further, it's unfortunate, but a lot of us give up. You know, we, we think we can't get over whatever the situation we're going through is. But God, once again, he's always made a way of escape. And when you truly understand that no matter how boxing you may feel, God has made a way so we can get through whatever situation, whatever hardship, whatever thing that we're going through, he will get us through. And I want us all to understand that today because we can't hold on to these thoughts, ideas, and suggestions that Satan is pushing on to us. Because if he pushes these things on inside of us and we take them and make them our own, we are truly trapped. Okay, we are truly in a place where we, we, we cannot get out of. Why? Because we're making what Satan says to us, we're giving that the most weight in our lives. And we're making that our reality. And the Lord is saying, no, that's not your reality. I want you to understand I've been doing this, you know, for, for a millennia. I've been making a way for you since I created you. And I want you to understand I have made a way for you to be victorious in the very situation in which you're dealing with. Amen? Amen, amen, amen. I, I think it was a very strange verse. And it may sound odd when I bring it up, but it's in Luke, Luke chapter 4. And actually, I'm going to read up to that verse, but I want you guys just to take it in just for a moment. Because when I actually read it and point it out, you will say that is actually a kind of a strange verse. But I want you to understand how the Lord makes a way for us. As Satan in his dominion plots, the Lord makes a plan. Okay, and his plan for us is to maneuver it whatever way we need to maneuver for us to fulfill his purpose, amen? And because God has made this plan, he's put out, He's put things in the way, okay, or he put, he's put ways that we can get around these things in which we won't have no problem at all, but we must be guided by him to use these ways of escape, amen? Amen, amen. So here it is in Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, verse 24. Okay, this is Jesus speaking here. And Jesus said... Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth I tell you, there are many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were sh shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land, and Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zerapah, in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel at the time of, of the prophet Elijah, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman and the Syrian. When they heard these things, and when the Jews heard these things, all in their synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of town and brought him in the brow of the hill in which the town was built. So they could throw him down the cliff. They're talking about Jesus right now. They're mad at what Jesus said. Jesus is saying right now, you guys don't even truly believe in me. You don't have faith in me. But I want you to understand, there were some miraculous things done. And they were done to these people who were not even Jews. Right, and so of course the Jewish people were upset about this. Now they brought him to a brow of the hill, basically the top of the hill, because they wanted to throw him over the hill. Right, and that's where first uh, verse twenty nine talks about. They brought him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built, so they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. That's that first. Think about this right here. They had brought him. They they basically had had, had pushed him or backed him in to the brow, the top of this hill, and now all of a sudden. Jesus just passes through their midst. All these angry people, all these people uh, supposedly who want to throw him off the cliff, he just passes through. 
See, only God can do a thing like that. And this all this this is total totality of what this scripture is saying right here. He passes through their midst and he went away. See, these people brought him there, or, you know, backed him up to this place, so to speak. And all of a sudden he just walks through with no problems at all. See, that's something that God does. See, it don't matter how you know, much Satan wants to trap you in because you better believe Satan w would have had Jesus killed that moment if he could have because he couldn't fulfill the purpose that he needed to fulfill. And I want you to understand because Jesus had to go through certain things, okay, he had to do certain things to fulfill the purpose and prophecy of God. And Satan absolutely wanted to stop that, but he could not do so. Because God would not allow him to do it. And so when Jesus says Jesus passed right through their midst, I don't know what that looks like because I was not there. But what I do know is scripture says he made it, the Lord made a way for him in that moment. And see, when you may be in that 12th hour of the tribulation or the hardship in which you're going through, you may think all time has run out. The Lord will make a way for you when you stay there on, on his path. Right? He has made a way for you to escape whatever torture, whatever trial, whatever temptation, whatever test that you're going through. He has absolutely made a way for you. Amen? Amen and amen. And I wanted you to see this portion of the scripture because, see, God didn't just do this for Jesus. Okay, God's been doing this since he gave us his word. I mean, we see this thing happen in Genesis. We see it happen through the Old Testament. We see it happening through the New Testament. And God does this because this is what God does. He makes a way of escape for his people. And so when you see this at 1 Corinthians chapter uh, first, first Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, you know, no temptation has overtaken you with such as man. Understand, whatever you're going through, if you're that person right now under severe hardship, and you're that person right now, you know, that's going through severe testing, severe trial, maybe in your life right now, understand the Lord has made a way of escape for you. No matter where you're at, whether you're right now, you're laying in that hospital bed. Right now, you may be going through through a, a, a period of mourning. You know, you're right, whatever it may be, it's right now, you may be going through the maybe the worst trials and tribulations that you've ever seen in your life. The Lord has made a way of escape. Okay, He knows how to handle and how to work with His people. He knows how to build them up. He knows how to comfort those who love Him. Amen? Amen, amen. I want to take you to a place in Genesis here. And the reason I want to take you to this place in Genesis is because I want you to understand God continues to make a way for his people. He continues to make a way for those that love him. But I just want you to see it. And I like this portion of scripture in Genesis as it talks about Hagar. She's had a child by Abraham, and this is Abraham's first son. Okay, and I want to bring this up right here because he, as, as her, his, his first son grew up, it comes to a place where Sarah, his actual true wife, okay, had, had her own child. And when she had her own child, she never, she didn't want Abraham's son, Ishmael, the son who was born to Hagar, to be around her son, which was Isaac. And I needed to bring this up because, see, something's getting ready to happen harsh, okay, that Abraham probably didn't think that was going to ever take place. Sarah gets mad at Ishmael and Hagar, and she tells Abraham to send them away. And this is what it talks about in Genesis. Genesis chapter 21, verse 8. Genesis chapter 21, verse 8. It says, And the child grew... And was weaned. This is right here talking about Isaac. So Isaac grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian whom she had born to Abraham, laughing. So she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son. For the son of the slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. And the thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son. Now I can only imagine right now the position that Abraham is in right now. Because Abraham's probably in a position which he does not want to be in. Abraham loved his son. Okay, he cared for his son. He's been raising his son. Matter of fact, it, the scripture doesn't even say that you know Ishmael was laughing at something like something bad. It, it could have been something funny going on that he was laughing at. But when Sarah picked it up, she just didn't like it. She didn't want him around her son. Sarah made it very plain. Ishmael should not be the heir with my son Isaac. Simply meaning Sarah didn't want him to have anything, so to speak. Okay, she say, basically saying in her own thought process that this is the true son, Abraham, and so I don't want you, your, your, your illegitimate son to, to be here with my son. That's what's going on. Okay, here, nothing, nothing about family problems in the Bible, folks. <laughs> I just, if you didn't know that, this is, I hate to say it, nothing specific, because there's always family issues, okay, in the Bible. The Bible speaks plainly about these things, and, and it's something because uh, I want us all to understand, you know, Scripture even opens with family issues. You know, we got brother killing brother, you know, in the first family, so to speak. When I say the first family right now, I'm just talking about uh, Adam and Eve and, and their sons, Cain and Abel. And I'm only bringing this up because there's one thing Satan has always done. 
Satan tries to destroy the families. Why does he go after the families? Because he's trying to destroy the purpose of God. But moving forward, I just want to give you this thought process right here because here he is, he's working his work, and something's getting ready to happen out of here. And I'm, I'm going to keep reading here. Let's pick up quickly in Genesis 21, verse 12. It says, But God said to Abraham, Be not displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For through Isaac shall your offspring be named. And I will make a nation of the son of the slave woman also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and skin of water and gave to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder, along with the child. And he, and he sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Bathsheba. Now I'm bringing this up right here. So God, because of the way he loved Abraham. Okay, God said, you know, yes, I'm going to put the blessing, and the blessing was Jesus up. I'm going to bring in the blessing through Isaac's line. Okay, that's very true. But I also want you to understand, okay, I'm also going to bless your other son. Okay, the, the, the son of the slave woman here, and the slave woman was Hagar. He's, I'm going to bless him because he is your son. Now, I want to make sure I touch on this just for a moment. See, Abraham and Sarah actually cooked up a plan, you know, that God was already going to do for him. And the plan they cooked up, they tried to put something in place that God was going to do. God was going to bless Abraham and Sarah with, with their own son through Sarah. But because it was taking so long, they tried to take it into their own hands. And what they ended up doing was, I'm going to give you my servant Hagar, okay, and you're going to have a child through her. Maybe that's how God's going to do it, even though God never said that. Sometimes when we try to put God's plans in place, or we try to make it happen our own way, most times we just muck it up. We do it in such a way where, you know, where we have all these problems and issues in our life now, which God never planned on you having, but because you went in and tried to do it yourself, here we are. Okay, we're in this difficult spot, and that's exactly where Abraham is in. Okay, that's exactly what him and Sarah are dealing with, it, even though it was Sarah's idea. It wasn't even Abraham's idea. Now, once again, I have to have you guys know this right here because now Sarah is mad okay, that her plan actually worked. But now, you know, the thing that God said he was going to do because God's word will never come back void has actually took place. And she has her own kid now. And now she's upset because Abraham has, has another child, okay, in the plan in which she worked and with her child that God gave her. Okay, and now she's so upset about it, just send her away, this slave lady, you know, the lady, you know, she's basically saying, you know, this thing I put in place, I want it trashed. Okay, I don't even want it even to exist around her. Her son will never take the place of my son. Matter of fact, her son will never even have part of his inheritance. He, you know, get rid of him. And God is actually, when Abraham prays on this, because Abraham is upset, and I, and I love that he's upset, because the truth of the matter is, he's saying, I love my boy. Okay, I know it wasn't the plan, and I know he made some mistakes, you know, but I still love my son. And, and Scripture tells us he, he was upset when he heard this right here. And so it, it's this very, like, once again, verse 11, chapter 21, verse 11 says, And this thing was very displeasing to Abraham on the account of his son. So he was hurting. He was hurt that this was said to him. He was hurt that, you know, come on now, Sarah, I, you've been, you know, my wife is the one I love. But, you know, here, this plan that you, you've asked me to do, I went along with it and I have my son, somebody that's next to me, somebody that, I, that I've raised up. And all of a sudden, you want me to send him away? That's a hard place for anybody to be in. A hard place for any parent to, you know, to have to deal with. But God is God. And the thing I love about God, God already knew that this was going to take place. This may have shocked Abraham, but it didn't shock the Lord. And because the Lord already knew what he was going to do, he said, yes, the blessing will come upon your younger son, Isaac, okay, the way I wanted it to come. But I also understand, okay, for, you, for your, son, your, your son, Ishmael, the one you have by the slave woman, I will also bless him, okay, and he, he'll be the king of many nations, amen, amen, amen. But now I'm going to pick up here and walk down a little bit further because I want you also to see this. And this is still in Genesis 21 and it's verse 15. And so this is after Hagar and, and Ishmael were sent basically into the wilderness. So verse 15 picks up, says, when the water in the skin was gone, she put the child underneath one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite of him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, let me not look on the death of the child. And as she sat up opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy. And an angel of, of God called up to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. He says, Up, 
Lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make him to a great nation. Then God opened their eyes and he saw a well of water, and she went and filled up the skin with water and gave it to the boy and drank. And God was with the boy, and he grew up, and he lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bowl. He lived in the wilderness praying, and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. So I, I love this portion. I would not want any of my children, or you know, especially if something happened to me and my wife and my children to be in a situation like this. I couldn't even imagine it. That's how dire to me this, this seems. So she's in a place where they're in the wilderness, and they're, you know, she's, they run out of water. And they're at a place now, you know, where they, they need sustenance. They, they need that thir thirst quench, so to speak. They need something because if they don't have something naturally, okay, they're going to go through a death here. And, and it's so bad that the mother, she takes her son, Hagar takes Ishmael, and she, she puts him some, you know, a little ways away from her. And it says about a bow shot away because she could not bear the, the thought process, you know, to see the death of her son. So you know they're in dire straits. I don't know how long they've been out here, but they've been out here for some time, right? And I probably, to me, it had to be for some days. Because you can go probably a couple days without, you know, some sustenance. But once it gets long, you become in that, that dire strait. And nobody wants to deal, you know, or, or, or live in this condition. Because the truth of the matter is you can't actually live in this condition, right? You can't stay in this condition. And so we know it's so bad that, the, you know, there must be or she must think that he's at the point of death. Because to put him in a place away from her... Okay, so I can't look on the death of my child. That means death is near. And I, and I have to get you guys to understand it. These people are not stupid. Okay, she understood exactly in the place and position in which her and her son were in. And so I cannot look upon the death of my child. But God sees exactly where they're at. And, and I love this portion of it because, see, it, it is something. No matter the strength, the, the, the temptation, the trial, the hardship that you may be going through, God sees you. God sees you. If you remember in Genesis also a little bit earlier in chapter 16, Hagar is also the one who first called God, uh, the God who sees. She, this is where we actually learn this through Hagar. Er, Hagar called him el Rai, okay, the God who sees. You know, and, and I want you guys to understand this because she was going through hardship when she ran away the first time. When she ran away the first time, you know, she was going through trials and tribulations and struggles, but God told her to go back. Because God had already made a way and a plan for her. But she also said, you are the God who sees. You are the God who sees me in whatever difficulty, whatever trial, whatever hardship I may be going through. You see me. You have not forsaken me. You have not left me. You, 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 you have not, you know, cast me away from you. You see me. And I love this portion of scripture because it lets you know, it lets us all know, right, that whatever I'm going through, my God, my God sees me. My God wants me. My God loves me. And here she is, okay, with our son going through this hardship and the Lord automatically makes a way of escape. He, he makes a way for provision to be there. Okay, water, this well showed up and all of a sudden they, they're filling up this water and then they're getting the substance, sustenance, the natural sustenance they need on the inside of their body to move forward. I want us all to understand, okay, God provides. God, you know, he, he provides for us. He sustains us. You know, we have to just trust in who he is. Because he's the God that not only sees us, he's the God who also provides for us. He's also the God that makes a way of escape because that's exactly what he did for them right there. You know, they're going through this hardship, but here, the, the, uh, here it is. This water all of a sudden is there. It, it wasn't like it was there before because Hagar would have known that there was a well there. Okay, they, they would have saw or heard water being there, but all of a sudden, they, you know, the Lord does what he has to do to make a way of escape. See, sometimes... Our way of escape may be something that the Lord provides for us naturally. Sometimes he may provide a way for escape supernaturally. And I want us to understand that. You know, we were in a predicament a little over a year ago where we needed the Lord to do something for us, and it was supernaturally. Absolutely, that's exactly where we're at. And what I simply mean by that, with my son, the doctors could not do anything for him naturally. And we know it. You know, we sat there and we watched our son go through such hardship and turmoil. We sat there and for 10 days he was on full life support. We sat there. I was there in the moment where I saw my son couldn't even really breathe on his own. Okay, if they didn't have those machines, if they didn't have those, those things there in which to keep him breathing, he would have passed. He would have passed away. 
And even when he was on the machines, and once we got all the tests back, you know, they basically were preparing him and his mom, him and his mom, they were basically preparing me and his mother for to see the death of him. Because they did not believe he was going to survive the ordeal in which he was going with, especially with all the, the, the uh, stuff they were getting back regarding his blood and regarding everything his body was going through. They didn't believe he was going to survive. And so we needed the supernatural to kick in. We needed the Lord to show up. We needed the Lord to provide a way of escape. We needed him to make a way when there was no natural way for us. But that's something that only God can do. See, when it may seem impossible on the natural side, we know it's possible with God. And see, with him also because we know anything's possible with him, we have to put our trust in him. And we saw the fullness of this because we saw the fullness of when the Lord woke up our son. We saw him go through, you know, we have to trust in him when we were going through all the things that we did not want to see. We did not want to see the death of our son. We did not want to see those tests come back the wrong way. We did not want to see all these things that could have been negative, but we have to trust in him more than anything because we knew he was the only one, the only one that could wake him up. And we saw the end of our faith, but we had to trust in him. Amen. Amen, amen. Now, I'm bringing this up here because we know the Lord makes a way of escape. And you have to trust that he will make a way of escape for you, even in your most dire straits, your most dire conditions. When you think there is no way, you know the Lord is the way. Amen? Amen, amen. I want to pick up here and go a little further because I also want you to see the Lord has done this numerous times in the Bible. I told you about him doing this in the New Testament with Jesus. I told you about him doing this also in the Old Testament with Sarah. But he did this so many times in even David's life. David was going into battle after battle when he you know, all these wars that he had to fight, all these battles that he had to fight, or, uh, fight, all these conditions in which he was in where there was always more, okay, on, on the other side, on the enemy side. But God took David he took him through a way of a process. He took him through, you know, uh, through battles in which they were they were more than enough people, you know, on the other side to overcome him. But because he had God on his side, they were always winning battles. They were always overcoming. How does David, as a young teenager, overcome a giant? Okay, who seems like he was made for war only through God. Only through God do you overcome these things like that. You know, we can look at this. Through Gideon, we can look at this, uh, I mean, in, in other areas, because it seems like God's people, and I'm going to just say it the way it is, it seems like God's people always have these adverse conditions, where there's always more on the enemy side than it is with them. But they always overcome because of who? God is on their side. And if we could truly take it in that there's more on our side than with them, then we'll get the understanding which we need to move forward. It's like when Elijah and, and, and his servant Gehazi, you know, were, were under, getting ready to be under attack by this army that the king sent for them. But Elijah wasn't worried about it at all. And, and Gehazi is, is, is in terror, you know, in fear right now because, like, you know, we're going to get mollywhopped, right? And, and Elijah says, Lord, he prays and he says, open up my servant's eyes. And when the Lord opened up his eyes, he saw the armies of heaven. He saw all, you know, all these angels with all these special, you know, battle weapons that they was getting ready to mop the king's army with, right? But he couldn't naturally see it. See, some things we have to, going to have to see spiritually. Some things we want to know spiritually. Why? Because we will not be able to see them with our naked eye. But when you know you belong to the Lord, when you know that the, the kingdom of heaven is your home, that means your army is there to protect you. That means your God is there to send out whatever he needs to send out to set you free. And I want you to understand that because some of us, we're so locked up and we're not free. Why? Because we don't truly take in who is protecting us. If you know your God is greater than any God, if you know your God is greater than anything, if you know your God is the creator of the heavens and earth, he has all power over all things. You can be so free right now, this moment, because you know your God is for you. And because your God is for you, he will protect you. Even Jesus, Jesus' purpose was to go to that cross and do the very thing that he had to do to save us, to make sure that his blood would, would, would cover us. But it's something because even when he was talking to Pontius Pilate, and as he was talking to him, he says, you know, I want you to understand at this moment, basically, I can call down 12 le legions of angels. But I must fulfill the purpose of my father. And what I want you to understand right now, as sons and daughters of the Most High God, we have that same ability. Father, send heaven's, heaven's armies to protect me. Send heaven's armies to make sure I'm okay. And, and because we, 
we're covered just like that. We know that nothing here has the right to just take us. Nothing here has the right to just overcome us. See, the only thing that's going to take place in our lives is what the Lord allows to take place in our lives. And when the Lord allows us to go through certain trials and tribulations for a reason, and most times it's just to develop us. It's just to increase our faith. It's, get, it's to get us to a place in which he wants us to go to take the position that we need to take. But we have to go there first to prepare ourselves. Amen. 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 We have to stop thinking every hardship, every struggle, every, you know, every, every difficult thing we go through is going to be our end. No, it's not going to be my end. It's not going to be my end. I can tell you in my own life, my own life, two times I almost died. Two times. I literally Two times I almost died in my own life, but I know my purpose was not over. Uh, you know, I, I almost died one time as a young boy. Okay, I, I've told this story before. I, I fell off uh, the second story of an apartment complex, and I fell on my head to a cement floor from the second story as a young boy. Okay, now nah, the devil couldn't kill me. God wouldn't allow it. The second time I actually was in college. Okay, I had a surgery that went bad, and man, I, I've, that surgery almost killed me. There's no other way to say it. It took me, what, three to four surgeries to get back right, but God spared my life. Spared my life. He absolutely did. And, and I look back at that right there. I, I also understand now that my purpose was not yet fulfilled. It was not my time to leave this earth and not that way, amen? And I want us to all understand that because, see, truthfully, the matter is if we just get to where we need to get to, you're going to only leave this earth when God says your time is over and not a moment before there. And see, when you fulfilled your purpose, when you've done exactly what God has wanted you to do, okay, if, you, if you're doing that, or if, you, if you've done that already, then it may be time for you to leave. But if you have not done that, and you're truly off with the Lord, just like Jesus did, you're going to pass right through the midst of your enemy. Because your enemy has no power over you when you're with God. I want to pick up here the 20th, 23rd Psalms. And the reason I want to pick up on this 23rd Psalms is because I want you to see how David... How David looked back over his life. Most scholars believe that this song was written in David's latter years. And when David was looking back, how God had kept him, how God had, had, you know, blessed him, and how God kept him alive through all the battles, all the wars, all the difficult things that he had to go through. And I, and I love what it says. It says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. It says, yes, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For my God is with me. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. Thou prepares the table before me in the presence of my enemies. And thou anoints my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Amen. I, I, the reason I love this is because see, when Dad he looks back, he looks back how the Lord has guided him, as the Lord has kept him. You know, and he says, he leads me the path of righteousness. He, he tells me in the way in which I must go to make sure I stay with him. And long as I'm willing to listen, long as I'm willing to do what he asks me to do, I am protected. A lot of us have to get that on the inside of us. As long as we are doing what God is telling us to do, we are protected. Okay, the Lord will make sure we make it out of the hardship in which it comes upon us. Isn't it something, though? It's something because... As I was just telling you a moment ago, we always look like we are overwhelmed by the enemy because that's what the enemy does. He, 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 you know, when you look with your natural eye, yes, you are overwhelmed. Yes, there are more against you than are with you. Yes, there's a giant that you cannot defeat on your own. You know, but it's something. As long as we realize our God is for us. He is the true giant. And as long as we are in him, as long as we are existing in him, okay, then we become the same giant that he is. Because you can't overcome or overwhelm my father, I'm not going to be overwhelmed today. Because I'm also in him. Amen? Amen. And we got to get this on the inside of us. And so when he's sitting there, you know, even he says, even though I walked in the valley, the shadow of death. See, death was real around him. I want you guys to understand. It's, it's not like, you know, when he says a shadow, like it wasn't real. No. God is the very person that made it a shadow. So the very thing you're going through, even though you may have the worst report in the world, I want you to understand, okay, God is the one who makes it a shadow. Okay, he, he's, he, he, he's the only one that can make, you know, dire circumstance a shadow, not real, surrounding you. So even though your body may be under attack, even though they may say you're getting ready to get out of here, you're getting ready to leave this earth, I want you to understand, hey, cry out. Cry out to him. And if, one, if you know your purpose is not done on this earth, hey, thank you, Lord. 
Thank you, Lord, for sustaining me. Thank you, Lord, for renewing the purpose that you put on inside of me. Thank you, Lord, for renewing my body, renewing my mind, so that I may understand that I am a giant when I'm in you. And, Lord, I thank you for doing the impossible. I thank you for doing the, the very thing they say can't be done. I thank you, mighty God, because I know all things are possible through you. Amen. And that's where David is. So when David is saying, even though I walk through the valley in a shower of death, my God is with me. His rod and his staff, they conquer me. God is the very one making these dire situations shadows. And shadows can't harm you. Shadows are not real, but they look real. They look real. So stop seeing with your natural eyes. Stop taking things in naturally. Sometimes you got to just take things in spiritually. So we walk by faith and not by sight. And that's what comes up. That's what we need to understand. We walk by faith and not by sight. So sometimes you got to close your eyes as you're going through the natural things that you're dealing with. You know what I mean? Close your eyes. Close yourself off to the natural things you're healing. Close yourself off to the natural things you, that you're feeling. Yes, I understand that they're very real. But God will make them a shadow in your life when you continue to put your trust in him. The hardest thing I rather I should say with the Lord concerning me is I have never liked how the Lord always comes in, in my life in the 12th hour. Like, Lord, couldn't you come earlier? Could, couldn't you do this earlier on, like when I was first praying about it? Did you have to let me go through all this right here to just realize, you know, that yes, I knew you were going to do it, but did I have to go through all that difficulty? And it's something when I truly understand and I look back, I realize that the Lord developed me every step of the way. You know, he... he took me to a certain place when I had to go through this. And because, you know, I, I was dealing with this, he took me to another higher position. And what I simply mean by that, as you're going through the development process, God's going to continue to take you to the next level, the next level, the next level. But to get to the, the level that he needs you to be, you got to be tested. you got to go through the trial because those are the very things that strengthen you, strengthen your fibers so you can get to the next level. So that's why he allows these things to take us so far. Lord, but I was suffering when I went through that. Hmm. It's something about suffering. It's something about long suffering that, that, that you know, works its perfect work through you. But you have to understand that in his word. It's something when you're going through the hardship, you know, and you're learning how to deal with you, when you're learning how to wait patiently, when you, you know, because as you wait, waiting is an action, but when it says patiently, patiently is a mindset. When you're going through all the hardship, can you still be for me? Will you still trust in me? Even though you may be feeling this thing, even though you may be going through some pain, will you still honor me? As you're going through these things, will you give up on me or will you trust in me or will you stay with me? You get to see all of that about yourself when you're going through trials and tribulations. Amen. 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 So when we look at this right here, also, David sits there and says, you know, I, I, you, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You are normal here with oil. My cup overflows. The reason I love this so much is because you know what? The Lord says, you never have to run. You don't have to run from your enemy. Hey, Lord, so I've made a way for you. Okay, there's no need for you to run. They, that, that very thing that they came, uh, came against you with that very sentence, sentence that they pronounced against you, I want you to understand there's no need for you to run because you're with me. As a matter of fact, I'm going to prepare a table in front of your enemies so they see you being blessed. Isn't this something how the Lord does certain things? You know, the Lord will make a, make a way where your enemies see you being blessed and they can do nothing about it. Nothing about it. Why? Because God has blessed you. He has blessed you. Scripture says the Lord makes rich and add no sorrows to it. What that simply means the Lord blesses and, and, and nobody can come and add sorrow to it. Nobody can take it away. No, nobody can do anything about it. They can only watch you being blessed. I love that portion right there. Because as the Lord continues to bless this family, to bless me, to bless you, you know what? I'm also understanding all that. What God gives you, nobody can take away. Nobody can. Nobody can come in and take God's blessing off in your life. When he has blessed you, you are blessed, period. Amen? Amen, amen. So I want you to get all that and, and take this in. I think the last story I want to tell you, and I'll just make it quick here. I have a lot actually in this last story, but I'll, I'll make it quick. I want you guys to think about how the Israelites were backed up against the Red Sea. The Lord had did these wonderful miracles in Egypt as he was freeing them, and now they're getting ready to go to the promised land, so to speak. But as they're going to the promised land, they realize this night, Pharaoh's army is coming after them. And they have Pharaoh's armies on one side, and they're backed up against the Red Sea. And I love this right here, because the people started crying out. 
And they weren't crying out for God. They were actually basically cursing God. Like, why have you let us out here to die in the wilderness? You know, they're, they're crying out against him. But God being God has already made up, made up his mind regarding that he's getting ready to free these people. And it, because he does so, look at Exodus. Exodus chapter 14, verse 21, and we're going to be done after this. Exodus 14 picks up. It says, Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land. And the waters were divided. Verse 22 picks up and says, And the people of Israel went to the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and to their left. Then the Egyptians pursued and went after them into the midst of the sea. All Pharaoh's horses, his chariots and his horsemen. And in the morning, morning watch the Lord in the pillar of fire and a cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging the chariot wheels so they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from before Israel. For the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, so that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to this normal course when the morning appeared. And the Egyptians fled into it. The Lord threw the Egyptians to the midst of the sea. Now what I love about this right here, when I see it, of course we, we know the Israelites crossed you know, the, the Red Sea here. But I love how the enemy knew that the Lord is fighting for his people. Because they said it right there in scripture. <laughs> and I, and I, I got to bring it back up because let, let me find it real quick again. I got to find this because this is so good. It says, let, let us flee from before Israel. For the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. So the Egyptians, the, the people in the military, they knew that God was fighting on Israel's behalf. And see, the reason we can sit at the Lord's table and be blessed in front of our enemies is because our enemies will know. That their God, their Lord is fighting on their behalf. We can't win this thing. We can't win this thing. And one thing I also want you to understand, when Satan and his dominion know they can't win this thing, they flee. They go back the other way. Family, I want us to understand the Lord makes a way of escape. You know, come after this if you want to. As the Lord did the Egyptians in the Old Testament, he will also do for us on our behalf. Our enemies will be conquered by him. So if they're smart, they'll turn back and leave us alone. Because you can't stop us from being blessed. For we are the Lord's people. And we got to remember that in all circumstances. Amen? Amen. Father God, help us to always remember that you provide a way of escape. May we always hold on to that. Even when we can't make up a way of escape, even though we can't see a way of escape, we must always know with you that all things are possible. And if you say that there's a way of escape for us who love you, then we know it's a way that we're going to make it out of it. Amen? Amen, amen. Father God, I thank you for this day. I thank you, Father, for your word going through each and every one of us. I thank you, Father, that you, how you continue to just love upon us and keep us. Thank you, mighty God, for healing us, helping us through our trials and tribulations, helping us to be better than, which we were, than we've ever been. Thank you, Lord, for all good things. Thank you, Father, for blessing our families, providing for our families, seeing us, mighty God, and, and all things that we're going through. Thank you, mighty God, for your wisdom and understanding. And help us to understand, Father, that you are always for us. Thank you, mighty God, for comforting us. Comforting those who are going through hardships and mourning. Thank you, mighty God, for loving us. And make us stronger than you. In Jesus' name we pray. We say amen, amen, amen. Family, that's all I have for you this morning. God bless each and every one of you. You guys all take care. Have a blessed week, and I'll see you later. Bye now. If you are the sound of my voice this morning, you want to know Jesus Christ for the very first time? Romans 10 9 simply states that if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, that you shall be saved. So if that's you this morning, you want to meet Jesus for the very first time, simply declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. And if that's you this morning, you now belong to the kingdom of God. That's the first step. But there's a powerful second step that you must take. Okay, it's the second step is your transformation to become a disciple of Christ. Okay, for you to transform, you have to pick up the Word of God and start reading it, start taking it in. To get with a good Bible-based church so people, the people there can help you to become the person that you're supposed to be in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. If you can't find nobody in the area in which you're in, you can always find us at harvestvillage.org. Okay, you can email us at admin at harvestvillage.org. And that should be on the bottom of your screen, admin at harvestvillage.org. Amen? Amen. For any reason you may have stepped away from the Lord, Okay, and you're looking to come back. And 1 John 1, 9 simply says the Lord is faithful to forgive all those who ask for forgiveness. So repent. 
Turn away from what you're doing and turn back towards God. Ask for forgiveness. The Lord is ready to put you back in your rightful position. Amen. Also get with a good Bible-based church as they continue to help you to find the Lord okay, and walk in his truthfulness. Well, family, that's all I have for you this week. Thank you for joining me this morning. Okay, thank you for listening to the word. Thank you for studying the word. And have a blessed day, family. Bye.